In this video, I'm giving you more evidence for justification by faith alone in the Apostolic Fathers. Many Protestant scholars and apologists bite the bullet on this one. They admit sola fide was fairly or even entirely unknown in the early church. This video could be considered the second part of a video I made a couple of weeks ago addressing the same issue. And of course, I did give some background for justification by faith alone from the Bible itself. If you didn't see that video, click here now or in the end of video link. I'll also include it in the description. Nonetheless, I focus mainly in that video on Clement, particularly first Clement, I say in the first video, I opt for a fuller understanding of faith, at least true saving faith, a definition that could include in some contexts the inclusion of the word obedience, and that's why sometimes I like to define faith as faithful obedience. Since I think that's what faith is in its simplest form, it's obedience of the heart to the gospel. It's a yes, Lord, if you will. That's what Abraham said to God, spiritually speaking, when he was justified. This is what Paul talks about in places like Romans 1.16, Romans 6, and it's what he refines faith down to in its simplest form in Romans 10, when he says, we believe with the heart and are justified. This is what saving faith is, and this connection is at least recognized by Calvin, though he seems to define faith more as a casting of our souls onto God's mercy. Sometimes the actions of true faith produced are showcased as faith by people like James, where he actually says that Old Testament examples like Abraham were justified by faithful obedience, or as he calls it, works. I see literally zero contradiction between this and the soteriology of Paul. It's just that they were using the words and concepts in a fuller sense than we do with our modern preference for precision. Many have noted how the ancients often spoke in the terms of a part for the whole or a sign in place of the thing signified language. That's how I reconcile Paul and James. I see the justification they both speak of as a declarative act, and the only difference is that James is speaking of the sign, the outward action of faith, and Paul, the thing signified, the inward act of the heart. It's just a little confusing for us because James technically also uses the word faith to describe dead mental acknowledgement of the demons, but he does that just before he goes on to describe what true saving faith looks like outwardly. And I truly believe that James and Paul would not see the same contradiction we see 2,000 years later. It is in this sense that I believe any biblical author or church father would say we are justified by faith alone. It's a no-brainer. It's because in their worldview, faith is an action. It's not the metaphysical, platonic mentalism of our culture. It's saying, yes, Lord, in your heart. It's a trust a commitment to God's commands and promises. But enough of the backstory. I can touch on these specific things in future videos. Now remember, Catholics claim Luther and Calvin made this all up. They admit sola fide was fairly or even entirely unknown in the early church. But I think when you look at things in the right light, you'll see Protestant doctrines in the fathers. To start with, I'll show you examples in which justification or the concept of eternal life in Jesus are linked specifically to faith. And for that, let's begin in Ignatius when he says, For when you are subject to the bishop as to Jesus Christ, it is evident to me that you are living not in accordance with human standards, but in accordance with Jesus Christ, who died for us in order that by believing in his death, you might escape death. Notice here how Ignatius uses only the word believe as the qualification for how we inherit eternal life. Now, I do think that if you continue in this passage, it would qualify as what's called a perseverance statement, meaning he uses belief here as the practice of belief. I'll cover more on this shortly. But in the meantime, note how we escape condemnation or are justified through belief, through faith. Then he continues, be deaf, therefore, whenever anyone speaks to you apart from Jesus Christ, who moreover really was raised from the dead when his father raised him up. In the same way, his father will likewise also raise up in Christ Jesus who believe in him, us who believe in him. Apart from him, we have no true life. Again, the resurrection, our future vindication, glorification, or in some senses, justification, 
happens through and on account of faith and faith only. I don't see anything else mentioned here. Hopefully you'll be able to see a pattern as Ignatius continues in his letter to the Philadelphians. I have taken refuge in the gospel as the flesh of Jesus and in the apostles as the council of presbyters of the church. And we also love the prophets because they anticipated the gospel in their preaching and set their hope on him and waited for him because they also believed in him they were saved. Again, faith alone is the agent of salvation, correct? When you believe you are saved, now that faith produces something, anticipation or hope and patiently waiting, but specifically you see faith alone linked with salvation here. Look at this statement about how he views the means of his own salvation through faith. And when I said to them, it is written, they answered me, that is precisely the question. But for me, the archives are Jesus Christ. The unalterable archives are his cross and death and his resurrection, aka the gospel, and the faith that comes through him. By these things, faith in the gospel I want through your prayers to be justified. Ignatius here using justification in the sense of a future glorification. Nonetheless, he is specifically saying that he sees this justification that he speaks of as something that will take place through and on the basis of faith. And again, specifically faith in the gospel. Are you catching what he's saying? This, of course, isn't an empty hope, but biblically he expectantly anticipates that he will be justified through faith, specifically. Again, very clear. Okay, you say, so that's Ignatius. Are statements like this found in other fathers? Well, what about Barnabas when he sees eating from Ezekiel's tree of life as a metaphor for salvation by faith? Then what does he say? And... In Ezekiel's temple, there was a river flowing on the right hand, and beautiful trees were rising from it, and whoever eats from them will live forever. By this he means that while we descend into the water laden with sins and dirt, can't help but think of baptism there, we rise up bearing fruit in our heart and with fear and hope, that of course is hope-filled assurance, in Jesus, in our spirits. And whoever eats from these will live forever means this. Whoever, he says, hearing these things spoken and believes them will live forever. Again, hopefully you're noticing a pattern. Salvation, justification, new life, resurrection through faith. Then Barnabas also says, Now if in addition to this, the same point is also made through Abraham, we add the final touch to our knowledge. What then does he say to Abraham when he alone believed and was established in righteousness? Behold, I have established you, Abraham, as the father of the nations who believe in God without being circumcised. Did you catch that? When he alone believed, believed. Catholics like to point out that the scriptures only say we are not saved by faith alone in James, but apparently the opposite is true in the fathers. Yes, that may just mean that Abraham was by himself, but it still makes for good clickbait. And nonetheless, only faith is mentioned as the basis of Abraham's justification. Then finally, we come to the epistle of Diognetus, where he says plainly, and he revealed himself through faith, which is the only means by which one is permitted to see God. He continues in this section in which there is far too much Reformed theology to unpack in this video. So then, having already planned everything in his mind together with his child, he permitted us during the former time to be carried away by undisciplined impulses as we desired. This is before the coming of Christ. But because he was creating the present season of righteousness, season of justification, in order that we who in the former time were convicted, that's condemnation, the opposite of justification, by our own deeds as unworthy of life, might now by the goodness of God be made worthy, and having clearly demonstrated our inability to enter the kingdom of God on our own, that's total depravity or total inability, that we might be enabled to do so by God's power. But when our unrighteousness was fulfilled, and it had been made perfectly clear that 
its wages, punishment, and death were to be expected. Then the season arrived during which God had decided to reveal at last his goodness and power. Oh, the surpassing kindness and love of God. He did not hate us or reject us or bear a grudge against us. Instead, he was patient and forbearing. In his mercy, he took upon himself our sins. This is penal substitution, if you're familiar with that term. He himself gave up his own son as a ransom for us, the Holy One for the lawless, the guiltless for the guilty, the just for the unjust, the incorruptible for the corruptible, the immortal for the mortal. For what else but his righteousness, his justification, could have covered our sins. Now, this exchange and covering language very closely resemble Martin Luther and Protestant theology. That's an alien, external, legal, declarative righteousness. He continues, In whom was it possible for us, the lawless and ungodly, to be justified except in the Son of God alone? Oh, the sweet exchange. Oh, the incomprehensible work of God. Oh, the unexpected blessings that the sinfulness of many should be hidden in one righteous person. Again, penal substitution. While the righteousness of one should justify many sinners. Having demonstrated, therefore, in the former time, the powerlessness of our nature to obtain life and having now revealed the Savior's power to save even the powerless, he willed that, here you've got unconditional election and irresistible grace, for both these reasons, we should believe in his goodness. And notice there the foundation for everything he mentioned, justification, relationship with God, the exchange of our sins for his righteousness. These things are all inherited through faith. That's a great passage in the Fathers, by the way. I love that one. And this epistle in particular is one that many Catholics will discredit because it sounds so Protestant. Now let's look at some passages that show us a justification by faith alone and develop this intimate connection between faith and obedience. Some of these are what we would call perseverance passages, meaning statements in the scriptures or in the fathers that strongly encourage believers to continue in the faith. These are passages that the reformers were well aware of, as is anyone who reads their Bible. They saw them as an evidence that True believers cannot ultimately lose faith, and though I'll touch on the issue of perseverance of the saints in a later video, I bring them up here because these statements show the prominence of faith or believing in the salvation process to the point that I think we can definitively say that the apostolic fathers unilaterally and undeniably declare, pun intended, a justification by faith alone. The other thing I want you to keep a lookout for are how many of these statements highlight the intimate connection between faith and obedience to the point that sometimes the act of obedience is seen as faith. Let's start in Second Clement, where despite a debate on authorship, I'll at least accept this as an ancient Christian witness, if not as the very words of Paul's disciple. Let us therefore serve God with our heart, and we will be righteous. But if we do not serve him because we do not believe God's promise, we will be wretched. Fools. Fly, you fools. Here Clement talks about a serving-produced justification. However, as we continue to read, he explains the relationship between faith and works. Faith is the fuel. It's the driving force behind our service. And in Clement's eyes, like in James, true saving faith is seen here as the works themselves. Do you see what I'm talking about? If you follow the logic, and I'm doing my best here, a person is condemned, that's the opposite of justification, because of their lack of faith. In Protestant language, we could say these are the ones who produce no fruit because they have no root, and faith is the root. I think we see a very clear example of this part for the whole or sign for thing signified language in this statement by Polycarp. If we please him in this present world, we will receive the world to come as well. Inasmuch as he promised that he will raise us from the dead and that if we prove to be citizens worthy of him, we will also reign with him if, that is, we continue 
to believe. Do you see how Polycarp is using the verb believe? It's in the sense of a continued practice of faith. I really don't think he's talking here about just thinking Jesus is my Savior. I think Paul does a similar thing in 1 Corinthians 15 too, when he says, by this gospel, you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preach to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. Again, though, that part for the whole sign for thing signified thing, I think this gives us a better working definition of true saving faith. Jumping back to Clement, notice how he connects obedience and repentance to faith. Let us repent, therefore, with our whole heart, lest any of us should perish needlessly. For the unbelievers will see his glory, and they will be astonished when they see that the kingdom of this world belongs to Jesus, saying, Woe to us, because it was you, and we did not realize it. And here's the key. Nor did we believe, and we did not obey the elders when they spoke to us about our salvation. And their worm will not die, and their fire will not be quenched, and they will be a spectacle for all flesh. He refers to that great day of judgment. Are you starting to see these connections yet? Faith looks like something. It looks like repentance. It looks like outward obedience, because in its simplest form, it is obedience of the heart. That's Paul's definition in Romans 10.10 when he says, With the heart we believe and are justified. Again, faith alone. Speaking of which, did you ever catch Romans 6.16 where Paul literally says, Obedience leads to righteousness or justification? What does he mean? He's talking about obedience of the heart. He's talking about faith. Faith alone. That's Reformed doctrine. That's Calvinism. Here's another perseverance passage from Polycarp, but notice that he is very clear as to how we are saved, by grace alone. I also rejoice because your firmly rooted faith, renowned from the earliest time, still perseveres and bears fruit to the Lord Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you believe in him with an inexpressible and glorious joy, which many desire to experience, knowing that by grace you have been saved not because of works, but by the will of God through Jesus Christ. A couple of observations here. First, these same people were reading the same Bible we are. Go figure. Notice how his language is very reminiscent of both 1 Peter 1.8 and Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. And secondly, in Polycarp's soteriology, true faith produces works or fruit plus perseverance. Now, assuming he had Paul's words in mind here, we can add that we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, not by works. I think I heard a reformer or two or three or four say that. Now look at this connection the Didache makes with faith alone as the source of our salvation. Gather together frequently, seeking the things that benefit your souls, for all the time you have believed will be of no use to you if you are not found perfect in the last time. For in the last days, many will fall away and perish, but those who endure in their faith will be saved. Again, we see here the practice of faith Paul talked about, and I would add this is something an unbeliever can have without true salvation. It was true for ancient Jews and is true for modern Christians that some can take on the outward signs of the covenant, faith, without having true faith on the inside. Yet, most notably, look at how clear these words are. It is those who endure in their faith who are saved, not those who endure in works or signs or special talents or even love. No, in faith and in faith alone. All right, landing the plane now, I promise. But as I do, I want to look at a couple more statements about where faith comes from, because I think these help to drive home what I'm talking about. In fact, if you haven't done so, watch this video on total depravity in the Apostolic Fathers, because it lays the foundation for what I'm about to say. That being, regeneration precedes faith, and that this faith that the divine nature produces is alone the means of our justification. Additionally, wherever true faith is present, hope, love, and good works will follow. Yet as fruits or evidences that are an extension of true saving faith, let's start with this statement by Ignatius. I welcomed in God your well-beloved name, which you possess 
by reason of your righteous nature, notice, characterized by faith in and love of Christ Jesus our Savior. Being imitators of God, once you took on new life through the blood of God, you completed perfectly the task so natural to you. Notice how the righteous nature precedes faith. This is consistent with the Bible. Remember, faith comes through hearing. This is also Calvinism and Augustinianism. I would also note that faith comes sequentially first, before love. Note here as he continues his rationale. None of these things escape your notice. If you have perfect faith and love toward Jesus Christ, faith is the beginning and love is the end. And the two, when they exist in unity, are God. Everything else that contributes to excellence follows from them. No one possessing faith sins, nor does anyone possessing love hate. The tree is known by its fruit. Thus, those who profess to be Christ's will be recognized by their actions. For the work is a matter not of what one promises now, but of persevering to the end in the power of faith. Now here, Ignatius doesn't use the word justified, but it's the same principle we see in my first video on this topic expressed in First Clement. True faith produces something on the outside. The same is true of love for that matter. Nonetheless, faith comes first, and we know from a multitude of other passages that faith produces justification. I mean, Ignatius directly says faith is the beginning. Love is the end. Love is the fruit, the result. Now let's finish in Barnabas where he shows us that we are ultimately saved by faith. No qualifications. So brothers and sisters, we ought to give very careful attention to our salvation, lest the evil one should cause some error to slip into our midst and thereby hurl us away from our life. Some would say this is a proof text for losing one's salvation. I think he's just using covenantal language, but again, I'll save that for a future video on perseverance of the saints. He continues, For this reason, brothers and sisters, the one who is very patient when he foresaw how the people whom he had prepared in his beloved would believe in all purity, revealed everything to us in advance in order that we might not shipwreck ourselves as proselytes to their law. What's the antidote to condemnation, judgment, the opposite of justification is faith. Notice there is no qualifier here. It's just faith and faith alone. Now, in this passage, we see that Barnabas matches Ignatius on his logical order. Faith comes first. Here he explains that hope is a fruit, an outgrowth of true faith. And again, where does faith come from? It, along with hope, is sealed in our hearts by God. It's not of our doing. Listen as he continues. And Moses understood and hurled the two tablets from his hands, and their covenant was shattered, in order that the covenant of the beloved Jesus might be sealed in our heart in hope, inspired by faith. Faith comes first in him. Finally, Barnabas gives perhaps the most clear explanation of a Reformed soteriology that is faith alone preceded by the new nature and, as I've discussed in this video, a true saving biblical faith that is swapped out conceptually for the idea of obedience. Take a look at this. Furthermore, with respect to the ears, he describes how he circumcised our heart. The Lord says in the prophet, as soon as they heard they obeyed me. And again, he says, those who are far off will hear with their ears and they shall understand what I have done. Also, circumcise your hearts, says the Lord. In short, he circumcised our ears in order that when we hear the word, we might believe. But the circumcision in which they have trusted has been abolished. For he declared that circumcision was not a matter of the flesh. One might again call to mind here the words of Paul, who just happened to be Barnabas's good frenemy. Did you see what I did there? That faith comes through hearing. Nonetheless, notice the order. Faith comes from a new nature. God unconditionally elects and irresistibly draws us to himself to produce faith and justification. In other words, Arminianism is ridiculous. Pelagianism, semi-Pelagianism is a farce. God initiates by grace alone. And finally, notice 
the clear connection between faith and obedience to the point that in this passage, they are synonyms. This is actually consistent with the Hebrew word for hear, which implies hearing plus obeying. You know the scripture, yet he comes to the conclusion that belief alone is the answer in verse 4. And this brings us full circle to the sign for thing signified language. We see it in the fathers, and I really hope this cleared things up for you. I really hope that you see the apostolic fathers unanimously profess we are justified, saved, redeemed by faith alone. Like I said when we began, don't forget to hit that like button for me, to share this video with a friend, and to subscribe to this channel if you haven't done so already. What are you waiting for? Make sure you leave me a comment too. I would love to hear what you have to say. May God richly bless you, friends. And as always, it was great to gospel with you.